Okay, guys. Uh, feel free to ask me questions as I go. If anyone pops in or not, whatever. I figure this is just easier to do live. Then I don't have to upload it later. Uh, although I could do edits, but then who cares? I don't care about it, editing videos. So, what got what got me going? I figured this video would be about, which kind of ties into just I don't know. I find it interesting. But a lot of people don't understand manufacturing and how it creates jobs and how really complex and intertangled it is into the economies, whether it's state, local, even federal, and how that all works. I mean, people don't already think about that. But having lived in Michigan and having worked in industries that manufactured parts for bigger corporations like Ford Motor Company, I figured I would give my point of view of how that works. And um, mainly because, you know, Trump brought up about the Toyota plant and all that, and yeah, I'm reading comments and people really don't understand this stuff, at least within their little short comment. They don't understand that creating 700 jobs is creating thousands of jobs. Um, if you can keep a plant in a location, you got restaurants that people go to and entertainment and hotels and conference centers and all that stuff grows up. So I'm going to use an example. It's a real example. It's the Ford Motor Company, Lincoln uh, plant in Wixom, Michigan. They made the uh, town car there. Now that was open for forever. My uncle worked there. Uh, and the companies I worked for before were right down the road from it, and they were there for one reason. Ford, at one point, whether it was currently or at some point, was like their number one um, customer. So being a supplier and down the road, there's a lot of benefits to that. So a big plant opens up. They hire, I don't know how many, 10,000 people? I mean, it's a huge plant. 5,000 people? It's a lot of people. I'm sure you can look up the Ford Motor Company Lincoln Town Car Plant, Wixom, Michigan, and uh, look up those stats if you, if you care to, you know, be really precise. But anyways, it's a huge plant. It's miles and miles. It, it's really huge. And so you get this plant that opens up in a rural area because to build something like that takes a lot of acres of land to build. So you build this plant. You're going to produce one kind of car, the Lincoln Town Car. And, you know, that, that car is going to be shipped all over, over the country, maybe around the world, but mainly that car was U.S., U.S. sold car. Produced in Michigan, sold in Michigan, or sold within the United States. What starts happening is other smaller manufacturing companies that supply parts to that plant are like, well, why do I want to pay shipping to ship my parts from way over here? Maybe from, I don't know, Kentucky over up to Michigan. Why, why would you pay for shipping? So we're going to move our place or build a place that is just down the road. So we can manufacture these parts to our number one customer. And when we need to do a delivery, it's literally putting them in the truck, driving them down the block and delivering them. So you get those companies pop up. Then you get restaurants that pop up. Typically at first it's fast food because those are quicker to build. You get a McDonald's, you, you get Taco Bell, you get a Wendy's, you get a lot of stuff that pops up, especially in modern times. A lot more, there's a lot more businesses out there. So they start growing, then you get entertainment, then you get the hotel because you got people flying in that need to meet with the executives at that plant. They need a place to stay, or you as the plant need a conference area so you can hold conferences and then other stuff like dry cleaning and your little strip mall type centers start opening up haircuts. Uh, hey, before work I can get a haircut or after work or whatever the case might be depending on the shift you work. So you get this whole complex system that is growing a community, well, really making a community, because nothing was there before. And then from that, you're getting apartments go in, houses go in, where you need to have 
police department, fire department, uh, services, if maybe, you know, water starts going in versus drilling a lot of wells, and electricity. So you're employing a lot of people across everywhere. So you have a huge plant, and let's say they go out of business. Like they close the Wixom plant. That's not there anymore. Now you got a scar on the community because you got this huge building. No one can buy it because what are you going to do with it? It's acre. No one can afford to buy that. Only another manufacturer and another manufacturer can just build their own plant somewhere else and not deal with any headaches that maybe that plant, because it's been around forever, has bad design, not a good layout, they've added on. You know, it's miles and miles, and people inside would get around with golf carts. That's how big it is. <laughs> you had golf carts to get around. And uh, the parking lots are huge. Just the parking lots alone take up so much space. So they go out of business. Well, what's next? All these companies that were there supplying parks to them start closing up shop, whether they're moving, going out of business, whatever the case might be, they're no longer there. So you have all these empty buildings. Those people that worked in the plant, worked in all the other manufacturing, they start, they're not there anymore. They're moving away, they're finding different jobs. They're obviously not gonna be going to the fast food joints. The fast food joints are losing uh, customers, so they're losing revenue. The neighborhoods then, People are selling their homes, they're leaving. Maybe the homes are going down in value when you have a huge thing like that just close up. They're, uh, you know, it might be a $200,000 house. Maybe if you're lucky, you can sell for 100,000. Hopefully you don't owe them much, but most people do. And you're probably gonna go bankrupt at some point to wipe that out because obviously you have to move away to get a job. You have to do what's best for your family. So you move away. You can't make up the difference. You're going to file bankruptcy. In the meantime, that house is just sitting there. No taxes are being paid on it. Nothing's being taken care of. Uh, people will then... Uh, you got... <laughs> Losing train of thought here. I looked over to see if anyone was on. No one's on! It's probably a bad time of the day. But So you got, you got houses start going up. Those people aren't there anymore to go to the restaurants, entertainment, all that. So those businesses start letting people go. So maybe maybe the fast food person was living in an apartment. Now they can't pay for the apartment, so they're leaving. So you got a lot of vacancy for homes and apartments around the area. So prices are just going down. Uh, community, the community, you, you don't need as many cops. You don't need any, many fire department. You don't need many as many uh, trash, sanitation workers, uh, street uh, sweepers, or those that like cut the grass, take care of the parks. Maybe, maybe you were lucky and you put in a five hundred thousand dollar park for as the community because of the taxes. But now it's going to start going downhill. You can't replace slides. You can't paint stuff. You can't. You might not cut the grass as much just because it takes money and you don't have that tax money coming in from people living there from sales tax or from uh, property taxes, thus the schools go down too. I mean, you don't have as many kids, you don't need that big of a school as people leave. So then you have issue of uh, you, don't need, you don't need the education, so you start laying off teachers because you don't need the teachers. They start moving away, they start getting rid of their house. It's just, it goes down and down and down. So in a way, when when uh, the government talks about companies that are too big a fail, so that's just talking about one plant. Imagine if you're talking about the whole uh, Chrysler or GM, people say, well, maybe they should have failed. In some ways, I agree with you, because that would be the right thing to do. They couldn't make it, but at the same time, that the impact on the economy across the board would be so great among all those plants closing, it's nothing we have ever seen in this country. It would be really depressing. The uh, I don't mean depressing as in oh, I'm sad. Depressing is just it's a depressed economy. The uh, banks would have to write a lot of that stuff off, and we saw what happened with the housing bubble. It would be worse than that because you would have the whole nation. You probably have banks that would probably start collapsing, and then it's just, it would just be a continual downward downward spiral. You would have probably fast food chains that would collapse. 
assuming they're not just franchise zones. You would have stores that wouldn't need to be in certain locations. They would close because maybe they build up over time because, you know, first you got the plant, then you have all these other industries that are popping up. Then you have the restaurants, then you have houses and apartments being built, then you have stores being built because those people are shopping, gas stations. All that goes away, it turns to shit. It turns to, <laughs> into Detroit. Detroit is a prime example of what happens when manufacturing leaves. So, you know, Trump, you know, do, trying to get as many businesses as possible, whether you like them or not, it doesn't matter. Trying to keep businesses here makes sense. Saying we're going to tax you is probably more of a scare tactic. I, I think as soon as you drop that corporate tax and you make it competitive to anywhere else in the world, of course people are, are and by people I mean companies, companies are going to want to come here and open up manufacturing. There's a reason why we have uh, BMW has a plan, or say everyone has a plan in the U.S. Why? Because A, you save on shipping costs from shipping your cars, just like me as a business supporting, selling something to that plant, I open up down the street, I'm saving on shipping costs. I don't have to like ship it across the country. They're my main customer. Why wouldn't I move next to them? It would be crazy not to. And hey, number one guy watching. <laughs> but, so you, you will have those companies that come over and they're going to have a uh, car manufacturing plants here, just like BMW does. The reason, if you have never been or lived in Germany or Austria, their unions are more hardcore than ours are, and they pay their workers and they get so much uh, vacation time and this and that. It sounds great, right? But if you're a company, you know, it's just much cheaper for them to say, you know, look, we're, we're going to produce this car for the North American market. The U.S. is the primary target. We're going to locate that you know plant within the United States we don't have to do shipping costs across the ocean it, it saves a lot of money saves a lot of hassle and the wages are actually cheaper people find that hard to believe but that's why <laughs> those manufacturers come over plus their countries don't really allow them to uh, they're not going to take their prime car their top-of-the-line Mercedes or BMW and close those plants in Germany or Japan and move those over because their countries would not allow them to then import them back. Most of the cars that then are made here are for our market, you know. And no one cares if, if Toyota opens a plant in Baja, California, and then uh, sells the car elsewhere. But don't open one there and then import that car to the U.S. I mean, that, that's kind of crazy. I mean, if, if, our, if we're going to be a target market, then build a plant here. I mean, really. And at the same time, we've all seen the stuff that comes out of Mexico as far as uh, products. It's a step up from Chinese manufacturing, but it's not as good as made elsewhere, whether it's the U.S., Japan. It's probably the cream of the crop, and I could get into that. There's a good book to read on that, on, on their way of thinking. It's about continuous improvement, and then their whole train of thought is, you know, you tell a company, look, look, I can save you money by producing this part cheaper by this method as an employee. And it's just trying to always continually improve your work in your workplace. If your work makes more money, you're going to get paid more. Everyone wins. We're on the bonus system. You know, Ford, if you put in a good idea in the suggestion box and they picked your idea and it saved them $10,000, you got an X amount percentage. And workers here will only give a suggestion if they think they're going to get a reward. You're not going to put in a suggestion if you don't think you're going to get a reward, but you should always be putting in suggestions. You should always be trying to continually improve the place you work for, because if they make more, you're going to make more. Unlike popular belief that thinks, oh, they're just going to like slave labor. That's not how it works nowadays. I can, you know, go out and get a job elsewhere. I don't have to stay there, you know, where you're not forced to stay anywhere. It's not like the old times where it's like, oh my God, I have to stay there. And the one guy watching, you haven't said anything yet. <laughs>
Anyways, this has just been kind of bugging me, because people think that the, uh, that it's just as simple as saying, like, hey, it doesn't matter if we have this plant. And Michigan's a prime example. We're going to end up like Detroit and other locations if we don't get our act together with manufacturing. We need to bring these companies in. We need to have a, a lower corporate tax rate. Everyone's, like, worried about the wealthy people. Who cares? They create jobs. Poor people don't create jobs. The homeless guy in the street hasn't created a job. He's cost everyone money. I'm not saying you do away with the poor guy, but at the end of the day, he, he's costing money. He's not making jobs. He's not creating wealth for anybody. You know, that, and that's reality. Unfortunately, that is reality. It would be nice to, uh, by having a lower corporate tax rate, drawing these companies in. That's what our federal government should be looking at, going to companies outside the U.S., even if they're not American, and saying, hey, why don't you guys build here? You know, is it because the tax in this state's too expensive? I mean, states need to get involved on that, too. They need to be like, hey, look, we don't want you to leave. I, it would be better for a plant not to pay any state tax, but still keep all those employees. But, you know, there's people that are sitting high up that are saying, Ah, uh, you know, no, can't do that. That would be not fair to everybody else. But look how many jobs something big like that could create. That When you can create like 5,000 jobs, those people are going to be paying property taxes and sales taxes. You're going to be making money from a local and state level, not to mention federal level because income tax. So everyone wins, wins. It's a win-win situation. Really, it is. And, you know, I don't claim to be an expert, but it, it's not just one-dimensional. You have to look at the issue two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional. It's, it's like a dice. You're not just looking at the face of it. You're looking at what's behind it, what's on top, a cube, you know? There's many more faces that you're not seeing, and you have to understand that it's all intertwined if... One place goes up. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't kill a local economy, state economy, or or national economy. If say, you know, my my local greasy spoon restaurant goes out of business, it hurts a little, but it's not a big deal. But when you have businesses that employ so many people, when they <laughs> when they go out of business or close up shop, now you got all these people to deal with that effect every single facet of, of uh, society and you know you're not going to get that, those jobs back quickly it's just the uh, michigan really needs to think about how can they reinvent themselves because unfortunately the the automotive industry is dead in michigan i don't know why any manufacturing company would ever go back to michigan there's a lot nicer states i mean happier states healthier states more active states Colorado's one, for example. I mean, if I was going to open a, a manufacturing plant for whether it's motorcycles, boats, cars, trains, planes, it wouldn't be in Michigan. It's cold. It's dreary in the winter. It's It sucks. <laughs> and that's no offense to Michigan, but I mean, other than the, the Great Lakes and then the Little Lakes all in the inland, it, it sucks. It's a, it's a crappy place to live. So, you know, Michigan Ray has to think, what are they going to do? Or what are they, they need to reinvent themselves. What are they going to do? They can do anything, but are we going to be a, a tourism industry? Are we going to be manufacturing? Well, what is it, you know? I mean, and that's why Detroit has not really ever uh, come back. I mean, at one point it was the model city, as uh, Robert McNamara wrote about in his book. It was the model city. It was the city other cities wanted to be like because it was the most modern U.S. city. You go there now, it, it's dangerous, it's dirty, it's decrepit. Uh, yeah, they brought back like, like right downtown, and they brought back, you know, some little areas along uh, Woodward, and some condo type buildings. Uh, it's been slow work and it just sucks. I mean, I could get into, you know, why, <laughs> why, I mean, what, okay, I will get into it, why not? 
Mich Michigan is as far as Detroit. They like you see houses for a buck, a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks. You can buy a property a lot. It's gonna have a burned out home for those prices. Uh, you can get homes that you could probably move into for like ten grand, five grand, ten grand. But the problem is property taxes. They've never rolled back their property taxes. So you got like just a, a lot, and you have to pay the back property taxes. And even if there's no back property taxes, you're going to have to pay the current property taxes, even though there's no house on it. And, you know, that, that's pretty high there. Tax, taxes in Michigan for property is pretty expensive. We paid $5,600 on a $242,000 house, and we were not on a lake. <laughs> it's outrageous. And uh, there's no reason for it. And they've many times had to roll back their prior taxes in, in years or around Detroit. I don't know why Detroit doesn't really just say, hey, look, we're just going to avoid out those prior taxes owed. No one's ever going to buy the property otherwise. And why don't we just, you know, start fresh. Your house is worth $10,000. You're going to pay 500 bucks a year or something like that. You know, they could easily do something. And hold on one minute. I got a little one. Yes. Come here. Ha ha ha. What? What? Wave to the camera. Hi. Hi. Okay. What do you want? I want to paint. Okay. We'll paint in a little bit. Okay. I'll get the paint. Say bye. Bye. <laughs> okay. I'll be up in a minute. Love you. Go ahead. Shut the door, please. I'll be up in a minute. <laughs> and there's my daughter, guys. <laughs> she makes a star entry into the into my office. <laughs> you have a very good eye. No, I was I did not serve serve in the Corps. However, I grew up overseas. If you've uh, you probably haven't seen my other videos or anything, um, my father was with the State Department. So I, uh, yeah, I grew up overseas, the Marine Security de 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 Detachment. Um, if I would have joined, I would have joined the Marines because those are the uh, guys I hung out with a lot. So, you know, you buy the shirts to support the, uh, the Marine Ball. I have gone to a Marine Ball, actually. I went in uh, Lomé, Togo when I was there. That was a really good uh, ball. And of course, you know, put on to do all that, you support them by buying shirts and whatnot. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah uh, you know, I've had people, I, I try not to wear them as much nowadays, just due to the sensitivity that some sensitive people have about, you know, the whole, you're impersonating. There's way too many YouTube videos you can look it up. But some people just get carried away. But, uh, yeah, they don't understand that you can, you know, support the Marine Corps by buying a shirt when you're living there. And these uh, guys and gals, well, all the ones I knew were guys. Vienna, there were some gals, I, I recall. But, uh, yeah, they're there. They're there to, uh, A, protect the data in the embassy, and B, personnel. So... I always had great respect for the uh, Marine Security Guard Detachment. I have I have a ton of shirts. <laughs> I got a whole closet full. <laughs> yeah, I thought about what to wear for this video. I was like, I'll wear this. See if anyone notices. But yeah, so thank you for uh, uh, you know being in the in the service and for your uh, you know protection. So uh, that's, that's probably why I also support like mo motorcycle relief projects because I don't know, I've just been around the guys and I can relate to them a lot. I mean, when I was just out of high school and living in Lome, Togo, they, uh, you know, not much older than me. <laughs> so, you know, played basketball, went to the pool, went to the beach, you know, hung out with them. When you're at those little postings, it's a lot more friendlier like Vienna no I mean I went to the marine house for like drinking in high school 
you know, I would always get mistaken for, hey, where'd you go TDY from? Where'd you come from? Because I had the flat top and I don't know, I guess I looked the part. Although, <laughs> it's kind of funny being mistaken, you know, at the Marine House. Hey, where are you from? But I used to go there, drink, and just hang out with the guys. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, my, my whole rant about just manufacturing in, in, you know, kind of Detroit and stuff. I don't know. The whole Trump thing just had me started today. So I figured I'd just talk about that. That's why the whole beginning of this video is about just manufacturing. More Enduro gear reviews. Well, hey, I'll do a review right now. These are the, oh, I got these this past year, 2016. These are the Climb the Car gloves. They've changed them over the years. Let's see, I got my bag here. I got a bunch of gloves. Let's see if I can find them all. Well, found one. This was the older style Dakar gloves. A lot thicker le leather, thicker on the palm. Uh, they put some anti slip stuff on it just peels off the old ones last a lot better it's double double leather on the bottom here of the palm these ones are much nicer they they last a lot better then i have these ones that are their enduro search series their xc they are uh like golf golf gloves and wow i just noticed that yeah like the fingers are ripping yeah, they're made for racing. They're really lightweight. There's no protection. I I would probably skip these. My favorite has been the, even though they've redesigned it, has been the Dakar. Climb Dakar series. Yeah. And they used to have like this foam, squishy, leathery foam pad. And they went to this rubbery. I don't know. Probably a little cheaper to manufacture. Just, there's attention to detail. I'm trying to find the... So, like, on the old ones, it had climb. Just says climb on it, but it's, like, anti-slip for the levers. Obviously, that one's wore off more because used my inner finger. These ones don't have that. I think it had a little up here. And if it had it here, it's wore off. It just hasn't stayed on. So... Yeah, I like their older style. And it's just like foam down here. Much more cushier. So that's, that's the gloves. Do a spur of the moment review. <laughs> I will say another thing. Another thing about gear. As soon as I have it here. The, the helmet off to my side. Which, no, you can't see in the video. Here. This climb helmet. The F4, that's the F4, came in this nice bag, got this awesome bag, two huge pockets, right, either side, this little net pocket here, just a really nice bag. The uh, Krios helmet, oh, let's see what we got, the Krios, it came with this. So yes, climb. I don't know. Even if it costs like thirty bucks more, have a have, have a bag. <laughs> yeah, I use this a lot. I mean, I toss the helmet in it. It has all my camera gear, stuff I never use, but still have all the mounts. For the GoPros, you know, extra batteries, extra stickers, I put cables in, memory cards, and I take that with me. Toss the helmet in and put the GPS, everything electronic if I can, put it in there. And that's one bag, one expensive bag that I just, you know, don't have to worry about. Make sure I just always have that one. <laughs> So, yeah, impromptu little bit of gear. <laughs> I 
I mean, if you have any other questions about gear, feel free to ask me. I don't, I don't mind. I'm not shy. I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> I mean, I'm sponsored, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Obviously, just don't go by what I say. And I get guys all the time that would come up to me, oh, I didn't know Klein makes helmets. And I'm like, yeah, it's a nice helmet. It's a good helmet. Is it worth the money? I don't know. I mean, it fits my head. That's the main thing. Um, it's lightweight. I can tell you all the positives about it. Would I buy one? It's hard to say when you're getting, when you get something, you know. What would I buy? Well, you look back in my past. And I, showed, I showed this in another video. HJC. Why? Because it was like black, just a single color. It was cheap. And I don't know, maybe I spent 150, 200 bucks. I didn't spend much. <laughs> so their stuff is good. It's well engineered, well made, but at the same time, it is costly. It is it does cost money. So I don't shy away from that. <laughs> it's just like having the uh any of their stuff any stuff, like the Sinyas, they're good too. But there's a lot of companies that are getting into making the Bluetooth communications. I actually get People connecting, wanting to connect to me with me on LinkedIn all the time. Chinese manufacturers that are making no-name ones. Um, and I'm just like, really? There's somebody... Apparently, companies are seeing that the communication's becoming popular. So there's a lot of companies out there. I expect that market to probably get a lot more flooded with uh, various comms. So that's kind of interesting. And in fact... It, I would expect companies really start integrating the comms like Climb has worked with Senya for their helmets, for the Prius, the, the uh, 10U they call it. It's only sold by Climb. And I would show you it in my helmet, but my helmet's off getting a special treatment done. I'm having some decals made for it, so that's my... <laughs> My th it's just going to say trailtaker.com on the back with reflective orange. Kind of match our website. Orange tees. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought it would be a nice touch. So. And I'm looking to see if anyone types anything. That's why I like doing these live videos, though, because... I can start off on any topic that, you know, I just kind of want to talk about and then people come in and you can ask me questions and I'll totally divert to another topic. It doesn't have to be like, hey, motorcycle related or or related to whatever I initially talked about. It's, it, could, it could be anything. And that just kind of makes it interesting for me versus, you know, so many guys I've seen them do live things and they're like, okay, we're going to talk about the such and such giveaway or something it's like okay that's nice but that's all they talk about and it's like eh, well how about just keep it going what else are you doing <laughs> i'm doing this just for fun I, I don't know maybe i guess if they're doing it strictly i'm only going to talk about this one thing and i have a set time frame and unless i get interrupted again by my daughter um we'll see how long it lasts <laughs> she she wants to paint <laughs> so I'm not thrilled with that, actually, because that's always a messy prospect. Probably the best uh, camera I bought, I just saw this sitting there, the best camera I bought has been the Sony Handycam. It is a HDR-XR260. It has an internal hard drive. Now, when I look up the specs for this, it says 160 gigabyte, but this is 240 or 220. So I don't know if it was a special when I got it for, or, or something. Um, anyways, yeah, it works really good. It does 1080 by 60 frames a second. And it has a hard drive, so I don't have to worry about memory sticks, although it can take memory sticks in the bottom. So I do have one in there just because I have so many of these old SD cards. But uh, that's just in case I, I would need the extra spot. Or if I want to record to it, 
if I'm on a family recording thing at my aunt and uncle's house, I can pull it off with this and give it to them. <laughs> so yeah, it comes in really handy for doing product reviews and the picture quality is good and image stabilization, uh, the bike walk arounds. I know a lot of people will just use their use use their GoPro. I guess if you like, you know, got the back screen on it, but still, I don't know, it's not the same, you get the fisheye effect. So, I don't know, was that enough gear review? <laughs> now I'm lost for what, what to talk about. I mean, do I, do I go back on my rant? <laughs> Yeah, being a sniper is pretty hard, isn't it? I think there was one guy trying to do sniper ranger school. Uh, only vaguely met him. It was a wife's co-worker's husband, and then they got divorced. But he, uh, he was actually looking into, or was going through the process, but got denied the whole uh, ranger sniper school or something like that. I guess it was like, pretty crazy from... The one time I talked to him. Yeah, I can remember like the, the Marines like talking to them and uh, they would say like, you know, we have to stand there at the front, front door of the embassy. Like they're in their little booth thing. You get usually... Uh, depends on the embassy. You get buzzed in, and like in Vienna, there was like a local guy that would check your ID. But then you went up these, you went up the stairs, and you went to like the another set of doors, and then the the uh, Marine security guard detachment guy would buzz you into that set of doors and either let you through one of either door, you could go right or you could go left around. They were in like a little big glass booth armored thing and uh yeah i can just remember the them guys saying like yeah you know it's so boring standing there all day because you're standing at attention you're standing there and he, they're like you know for fun what we do is we recite movies in our head and sometimes we just laugh in the middle of no you know out of nowhere we will laugh because we're just recalling scene by scene of a movie because that's our entertainment while we're standing there I found that kind of funny, <laughs> like, like, wow, how boring. <laughs> of course, if shit hits the fan, yeah, things are going to get really exciting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can, I, yeah, I can tell you how much wasteful spending there is at U.S. embassies. Maybe I'll just talk about that until another question pops up. But, uh, yeah, living overseas, there's so much waste. I can remember in Africa... Uh, somebody was going to visit. I don't know if it was Bill Clinton. It was somebody. And anyways, they all went like, on the speculation that some so was uh, said to maybe come visit. And they never did, but they would go spend so much money. They'd be like, okay, let's buy a new flag. You look in the catalog, the new flag is like five grand. Like, really? Five grand for a flag? Oh, the ambassador one time mentioned during a meeting, Oh, I hate my continuously continuous roll fax machine. It'd be nice if this was on individual papers. And so the lady, the GSO lady that makes those purchases, was like, oh, you know, totally brown nose, ordered a new fax machine. So he gets in one morning and given his papers and he's like, what's this? Oh, well, we got a new fax. You said you would like it to just be, you know, individual pages versus the old school continuous roll. He goes, I like the old. So, like, they had to pull out the new fax. And you can't send that stuff back. You're overseas. You, there's no sending it back. So, there's a fax machine that gets floated around different offices. Then, brown nosing again, the lady uh, over her, he complained about his office chair one day. So, 
they ordered new office chairs at $5,000 a piece. He came in and he was like, where the hell's my office chair? I like my other office chair. So they gave him back the office chair and like the other ones floated around different <laughs> It was like pe people that shouldn't have a $5,000 office chair had $5,000 office chairs in their office. It was totally ridiculous. That stuff drove me crazy. And just as a dependent, but there I even worked. I, I mean, I worked at the embassy while, while being with my parents. Because that was after, right after high school. I went there, took some time off, and I went to work. It just, yeah, that, that stuff drives me nuts. Uh, well, I'm always planning rides. So February, I'm going to do a ride, I think, 10th to the 14th. Uh, at this point, it's going to be going east, very far east, and not Kansas. It's going to be going over towards Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma, actually. It's the Calamini, Calamini, I'm probably saying it wrong, uh, State Park. There's a bunch of dirt bike trails. Actually, going to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, probably first. Visit a buddy that has a ranch. He called it the Diablo, Mesa Diablo. And he put in a bunch of single track and stuff and built the building. And, and yeah, we're going to go there probably first. Check that out. And then head south down to this uh, state park that has a lot of dirt biking. I heard it's very epic. So that's coming up in February. If the weather is some reason too cold, uh, raining, snowing, whatever the case might be, then we're just going to probably head south down to the uh, southern part of uh, New Mexico and probably check out the Red Sands OHV area slash that just whole general area. It looks epic. So, yes, we have some ideas of what we're going to go do come February. March, I'm looking at doing the uh, Five Miles of Hell. I don't know. That's kind of dependent on somebody else that I have invited. Until she gives me her dates, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, and I'll probably have other, there's going to be other guys and stuff that are going to come out and do that. <laughs> hey, what? give me a minute. Five minutes. High five. Yay! <laughs> Love you. Okay, give me five minutes. I promise. Five minutes. We'll pay. Okay? One, two, three, three four, four, five. Four. Very good. Yay! <laughs> so it looks like I have five more minutes, guys. So look at the clock. Uh, 3.55. And then I'm out of here. So... That's our riding. <laughs> Watching is funny. Um, I, we're going to have a lot more riding. Uh, also going to do a challenge. I'm working with some companies to possibly make that happen. We'll see. Uh, FX Bikes, if you haven't checked them out, check them out, fxbikes.com. They make some awesome, uh, if you will, mountain bikes with motors. And <laughs> five minutes. What? Yes, that's me. How do you get on the screen? From the camera. I'll show you in a little bit. <laughs> okay. Five minutes, please. Five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> She's being cute, and I'm doing my father voice. But, uh, what was I saying now? Now I forgot what I was saying. So, yeah, we're gonna, going to go, oh, Five Miles of Hell. Oh, I'm, the, the uh, yeah, looking at doing an epic adventure on some, maybe those FX bikes. We'll see what they say. Going, or mopeds. I'm even going crazy to do mopeds. So, hey, guys, it looks like I'm going to have to go. Yeah, I should give my daughter attention. I've talked long enough. So, and now the dog's in here too. That's why I shut the door. But hey guys, thanks for watching. Take care. Cheers.